Church. Why don't we just give it up one more time from all our, or for all of our first-time guests and visitors. We're grateful that you're here. It's good to have our youth back from youth convention and uh, excited about what God's doing in our youth ministry. Uh, our hope and desire for you is really simple. It's, it really comes down to this, whether you're here in person or you're tuning in online because someone from this congregation may have uh, you know, sent you a message or you're seeing this on Facebook being uh, live streamed, is that you would grow in your relationship with Jesus. In fact, God gave me a specific word for our church family uh, at the start of this year, that this would be a year of trusting God together. Isn't that simple? Like, that we would be a church family that would trust God together on the adventure that God has us on. That we wouldn't fear, that we wouldn't be worried, that we wouldn't have anxiety, but that we would trust God and that we would enter into the season that God is calling us as the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert. Jesus is calling us to follow him into what he has for us. And so we are excited to celebrate that. That is our mission. That is our hope for you that you would choose to trust God with us together. And God's doing some really cool things this morning. I just want to highlight and say thank you to all of uh, our tech teams on our dream teams. We have a bunch of people who are behind the glass and behind videos and they help make this possible. And friends, why don't we just give it up for all of the people who never want to be recognized, right? That's why they chose to be on the tech team. And if you're thinking, man, I, w I wouldn't mind serving. I want to find a place, but I don't want to be recognized like that just happened. It'll be probably another year until I do that. So now is a good time to get on the tech team and you can uh, help contribute to what God is doing, what God is cultivating here in this community. We're excited. This series is called Crucible uh, Defining Moments, moments that define our lives, moments that change us. And last week we introduced the concept, the idea uh, of a defining moment, and sometimes defining moments can, uh, can mess us up, can deform us, can really get in the way of our relationship with God, but I believe God wants to redefine our crucible moments or define our cru crucible moments in a different way. Uh, with that said, there's some things that we are, are grateful for. Last week we talked about how we're grateful because crucible moments push us outside of our comfort zone. Uh, they force us to clarify what our values are, what is important. Remember, the Israelites really had a choice to make. They needed to choose between uh, freedom and slavery. That was really the decision that Goliath presented to them, freedom and slavery. And finally, we talked about fear and the opportunity that crucible moments give us to figure out what is God's way to manage our emotions. Our emotions can do this, right? And they can go up and down and up and down. And how do we find that consistent zone of being able to follow Jesus? I believe that crucible moments have blessings and benefits associated with them. But I also, this is going to sound a little weird, I also believe that fear can be a blessing if we appropriate it uh, in a way that God wants us to, if we manage it the way that God wants us to. And so how do, what does that look like to, to navigate fear and to walk through these crucible moments with the kind of uh, intent that Jesus desires for us? I mentioned last week that I was, uh, and, and still am a little bit afraid of heights, I, I was on a Ferris wheel with my brother. He started rocking it when I was young, and it kind of like, it just, it changed me. It made me afraid of rides for a really long time until I got to middle school, junior high, there was a girl in our youth group who invited me to the Puyallup Fair. I lived in Washington. Puyallup is the name of a city where the state fair is in Washington State. And I said, sure, why not? I like food. I don't really like rides, but we'll just avoid them. And um, we'll see what happens, you know. She's from the youth group, after all. And one of the first, <laughs> yeah, our youth are like, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the first questions she asked me is, hey, do you think you would be uh, willing to go on the, fair, or on the roller coaster with me. I started to sweat. I do not want to appear like someone who is afraid to my future wife. I was 12, okay? I mean, I knew that there was a long journey for us to go together and she needed a courageous knight in shining armor. Little did she know that I was not even willing to go on the Ferris wheel. But in that moment, they say in the, in the Bible, it says this, that perfect love casts out all fear, right? 
I discovered something about that statement that even imperfect love casts out a little bit of fear. <laughs> and I was willing to go to the roller coaster with this gal. Now, here's the thing. The, fer the uh, roller coaster in Washington is one of those wooden roller coasters, kind of like the one at Knott's Berry Farm, that really scary one. So just imagine me. You know, I get in. I get all strapped in. And the wooden coasters are, in my opinion, more scary than the metal ones because it just seems like they can break down easier. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, I know, I know, I know where my people are. I see, I see that head nod. And so, I, you know, you get into a roller coaster before Knott's Berry Farm and wh or whoever did, they, they started the metal ones where you just, like, go out at 80 miles per hour and you leave your stomach back where, you know, you got into the car. No, they start, typically, the wooden ones start out with just kind of going slow and you hear the clicks, click, 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 and then they start to go up. And with every click, you know that this thing is gaining elevation. <laughs> now, I'm sitting there with her right next to me, my future wife. At 12, you know, I, I, I knew it was destined. Thank God it wasn't, but that's okay. And so we're clicking, 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 and you get to the top, and I decided just to tempt fate to look over the side. And I realized that there was a reason why I did not like to be in rides and everything came flashing back to me in that moment justin the memory the tipping and i thought i was gonna die that thing stopped kind of at the top as they do because again they're trying to cultivate that fear right trying to like just boil it to the surface and sitting in there and it starts to creak forward and i'm, I'm not even kidding before this thing started to like catch momentum i just went She looked over at me, because we actually hadn't started going down yet. In fact, everyone was like trying to figure out, who is that guy? And then we started to go down, and she's just laughing. She's laughing her head off because she knows what is inside of my heart. And, um, and I started to laugh. Now, here's what the crazy thing that happened was, um, and I discovered something that uh, I've used uh, since then is that sometimes when you're so afraid and all you can do is laugh, that is actually the thing you need to do the next time to enjoy it, right? How many of you, when you're super like afraid on a roller coaster, you actually laugh? Okay, maybe not. Well, this gives you a really easy action step because you can go to a roller coaster and this is what happened. Like, in that moment, I started to laugh, and I realized, like, I, like this is kind of fun. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't have, like, seen myself as someone who enjoys this, but this is kind of enjoyable. And at the end of the ride, we got off, and I put my two feet on the ground, and I looked at her, and I said, wow, I kind of had fun. She said, you want to do it again? And I said, no way. <laughs> and then she got me to go on it again, because imperfect fear imperfectly casts out. All right, so... This is what we want to do with this series. We want you to rethink how you face these moments in your life that seem like it's just there's no way God wants to redefine. How many of you have ever been to Six Flags? Did you know that there's a roller coaster? This is for you, Donna, because I saw you shaking your head earlier. There's a roller coaster at Six Flags named... I always want to give you just an easy application. I'm just going to say, like, I'm giving you permission to go to Six Flags. It's an hour and a half, two-hour drive. Pay the 60 bucks and face your fears. Come on, somebody. You can literally ride Goliath and not die. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having fun. Fear is a big problem in society, and yet it can be a blessing if we learn how to navigate it. So how do we navigate it? With God. Why are we so afraid? What does it take to overcome it? Let's go to this passage. Fear is a major sub theme in this chapter. It's a major theme in all the Old Testament. And the reality is, fear is still a major theme in people because we are so easily convinced that this is the last moment we'll ever breathe, that there's no way God can be with me in this moment. And whatever crucible moment God's redefining you in your life or whatever crucible moment God is reshaping how you think about it I'm praying that God gives you the ability to trust in him 
in this season. This is what it says, it says in chapter 17, verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest. This is language that reflects an earlier chapter that we're going to reference here in a second. But this is what I want you to know. The author wants you to know how old David is and where he fits into this thing. And what you can expect from someone like a David. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Um, for 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said... To David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand uh, and see if your brothers are well. Bring me some token from them. This was common for uh, family members of soldiers to support the army who are defending the freedom of, of the rest of the community. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that you would speak to us this morning. Remind us that you are sovereign. You're over all. You're over everything. And Father, when we see with your eyes, when we feel with your heart, when we do the things that you did, when we're motivated by what motivates you, when the Spirit leads us and we are willing to follow, good things happen. Even in the midst of crucible moments, in fact, you use crucible moments to redefine a whole nation and to redefine the borders and to rede redefine even the fear that exists in our heart of things that we've just settled. We settled into this mindset of, of being afraid. We don't have to be. And so, God, we pray that you would use Jesus and your spirit to, to draw us into freedom, the freedom to follow you wherever it is that you've called us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I, love, uh, I love the tension that scripture often uh, uh, reveals. David was the least qualified person on the battlefield that day. David was also the most qualified person on the battlefield that day. It just depends on who you ask. You see, if you would have asked the people, they would have listed the order of the sons. They would have listed the firstborn's name, Eliab. Have you seen Eliab? He's handsome. He's tall. He's Jesse's firstborn. He's going to get everything when Jesse dies. He is the one to carry the family's leadership mantle. And if that wasn't enough, there's these other two sons that are there. David, no, 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 no. David is the youngest. He's the shepherd. He's the keeper of the father's sheep. He's the one that... Jesse is going to ask to, hey, bring some bread and cheese to your brothers. I, I want to make sure, literally, David is Jesse's cell phone, right? Hey, are you okay? David has to go to the battlefield, not because he's being beckoned to fight, but to send a message to communicate something back to dad. Yeah, the brothers are good. How many of you, a couple years back, maybe, <laughs> maybe more than a couple years, ever saw the movie Waterboy? Adam Sandler, David is the water boy. I'm not even kidding. David is the water boy. He's the one who's got the high quality H2O. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm kind of a water boy nerd. To come back to the to the to the to to dad and bring the message. That's who David is. That's what people saw in David. So. If that's what people saw, why am I saying that he was the most qualified to be in this position? Here's what I know about the Bible, and here's what I want to recommend. It's not really part of this. Read the Bible in context. So we're taking a slice out of 1 Samuel 17. You have to understand that this slice, there's a, there's a pie that fits around it. And one of the, uh, probably the most important chapter of David's life is actually found in the chapter before if you look in chapter 16, you will discover uh, a, a, a kind of a, a disappointing scene for a prophet who was used by God to identify Israel's first king. And Saul was Israel's first king, but he was a disappointing king because he had allowed fear and people's opinion to drive the way that he 
ruled. Uh, and if Saul were to be a good king, he would have to rule with God's heart and be led by God's spirit. Otherwise, God comes along at some point and says, this is not what I have for my people. And you are leading because I have placed you there. And I have a plan for my people. And because you won't bring them there, I'm going to choose someone else. And that's really what happens with Saul. He succumbs to the darker side of his leadership tendencies. And God chooses another. But God doesn't think like we think. God thinks differently. And the critical verse in this passage comes after Eliab comes out, the oldest, the better looking, the one who everyone expects to be the heir apparent. This is the guy that God would have be our king. He's the ruler and he's awesome and he's handsome. And here's the thing, God doesn't have something against handsome people or tall people. He's just really focused on something deeper, the heart. He says this to the prophet, who this encourages me so much, this is like for every pastor and preacher out there, like you can miss it and still hear God. So just keep, keep trying. This is what the Lord says to Samuel. After Samuel's convinced it is a lie because the prophet of God is thinking like people do. This must be him. Do not look on his appearance or on the, bright, or, or, or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. Man, what qualifies David was his heart was right before God. There was something in his heart that God saw. He wasn't convinced that David was the next king or wasn't the next king because he was handsome or not handsome. Actually, the text says that David was ruddy and handsome in appearance. It was because of his heart. There was something about David's heart. I, shaped out in the fields, taking care of sheep, not, uh, not too proud to be willing to go back and forth and be the messenger, courageous enough to fight a bear and a lion. There was something about God's heart that God saw when no one else saw it. And this is what God does when he sees a heart that he can bless. It says in verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. In verse 14, there's a juxtaposed reality with Saul. The, the previous now uh, eventually will be a deposed king. But God's spirit, this is what it says in verse 14, Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. You see, when God sees a heart that is for him, that loves him, God will give that heart spirit. Now, this is in the Old Testament. We need to understand that the Holy Spirit operated differently. The Holy Spirit and the Trinity, God, he doesn't change. That's why Malachi says, I am the God who never changes. The Holy Spirit existed in the Old Testament, but he operated differently. This is how the Holy Spirit operated. He would anoint or uh, give favor to certain titles or roles, artists, craftsmen, but especially kings, right? If you're going to lead God's people, you've got to have God's heart and you've got to have God's spirit because otherwise you're going to think and act like a human and you need God leading you, not your emotions leading you. That's what it says uh, in the Old Testament. There's all sorts of examples where the Spirit of God is poured out on people. This was the, the prophetic impulse in the Old Testament. People would speak out. Uh, they, would, they would speak on behalf of God. But it was, it, was, it, was, it was for periods and for times and for certain roles. This is what I know about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. He's available for everyone. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, the temple curtain ripped from top to bottom signifying that the presence of God is now not relegated for a titled position to lead God's people, but for all of God's people. That the family of God would be filled with the Spirit of God to courageously face what other people are terrified by. You might be thinking, well, I am not called to be a king. And you're right, God has not called you to be a king. He hasn't called me to be a king. I'm a pastor, a shepherd, not a king. The leaders of the church are not called to be kings. Nobody is called to exercise authority with an iron fist. But we are called to be God's body, given God's heart, and led by God's spirit so that we can do all of the things that Jesus desires for his body to do on this earth. 
And when everyone else sees nothing in you worthy of of following, if you have a heart that is for God, if you have been filled with the Holy Spirit and are led by the Holy Spirit, God can use you no matter what your title is. You might be the water boy and God could use you to bring a miracle into the life of someone on the field. God could use you to pray for someone and God could do something miraculous. God can use you if he has your heart and if you're filled with his spirit. These are the only qualifications you need, but we've got to see how God sees. Some of us are facing crucible moments and we have not begun to see even within ourselves what God has placed in us. I'd be the first to tell you that David did not live a perfect life. He sinned big time. But it's his desire, his softness, his sensitivity, his his desire for relationship that just keeps bringing him back to God. You know what Ezekiel 36 says? That God is the only one in the entire universe who can take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He can give you a new heart. If you're thinking there's no way that I am someone who can do anything for God because I've done this and I've done that and I'm callous towards it. If you say, God, I give you my life, God will give you a new heart and it will be followed by a pouring out of his spirit into your life to accomplish everything that God's calling you to accomplish in his desire for you. 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 7 says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. If you want to know how to walk into uncharted territories where everyone else thinks you're unqualified, why don't you try this? Go with God. (laughs) Because he's all you need. And David shows up on the battlefield and he's the only person qualified because of his heart and because of the spirit working in his life. You will not see an overt reference to the Holy Spirit in this entire chapter. But without the Holy Spirit, there is no stones, there is no David, there is nothing. He is being led by the Spirit. It's by the Spirit that we do anything in this life. Because the Spirit lets us see what we can't see with natural eyes. And man, there's so many examples of this in Scripture. God has to open our eyes to see what we're supposed to see. Remember Paul on the road to Damascus and the scaly eyes have to come off? We have to see what God is looking at for us to be able to understand the definition that he's giving us for the thing that we're walking through. This isn't just past, this is present now. If you want to see your future, you have got to see it through the lens of God. You've got to see it through the lens, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to see what he sees. He won't show you everything, but he will show you enough to move you in the kind of direction that he wants you to go to. This week I read a story of a one-legged Scottish school teacher. Do we have any Scots in the house? All right, nobody. One, there's one back there. Come on, Scots. Scottish, Scotch, Scottish. I'm just, I'm having fun, man. I'm feeling the Holy Spirit right now, so I just, it's all good. He was born in 1835 in Scotland, and uh, you might know this name, Hudson Taylor. Anyone know who Hudson Taylor is? Hudson Taylor was a famous missionary to China, and he was recruiting missionaries. And this guy, George Scott, this, this uh, one-legged Scotsman, comes up to him and, and, and says, Hey, I, you know, I heard you're trying to recruit missionaries to China, and I'm wondering if, uh, if, if you would be open to me. And here, here, here this is what... <laughs> This is what the man of God says. I almost hear Samuel in it. He says, with only one leg, why do you think of going as a missionary? Now, maybe he's just curious. Maybe I'm thinking badly of Hudson Taylor. <laughs> right? He's like, I, you know, you're, you have one leg. What can you really do over there? Yeah. George, had, he had heard that before. And this is how he responds. Hey, I don't see those with two legs going. And Hudson was like, well, can't argue with that. Come on, join the party. (laughs) You see, George saw something that nobody else was willing to see. 
because he had a willing heart. He was led by the Spirit. He was a man who saw an opportunity in a place he had never been because he had been changed by God to the point where his life was not operated by fear. He was living by faith. Why would a one-legged Scotsman back in the time when, 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 when the medical wasn't as where it is today? And man, so many missionaries back then, they would literally pack all their belongings in a coffin because they never expected to come back. But faith drove him to a place where he knew God would sustain him. That qualified him in terms of Hudson's perspective. Today, Wenzhou Municipality is, is, a, is, a, is an area that is not too big. There's so many amazingly large cities in China of about uh, 9, 10 million people. That was 9 million people back in 2010, so I can't even imagine the, the growth. Did you know that in Wenzhou Municipality that there are over a, over a million Christian Protestant believers? <laughs> Almost 10%. They literally call Wenzhou Municipality worldwide the Jerusalem of China. Do you know where George Scott went? God used George Scott, a one-legged Scotsman with a heart of faith, to start a movement in a place that is still flourishing with the gospel. Because he said, I don't see those with two legs going. You see, the Holy Spirit allows us to see what others don't. And when we begin to get a picture of what this is all about, God opens up opportunities. He creates bridges. He sends us to places that we didn't even see coming. What? Because that's what the Holy Spirit is desiring for us, to bring freedom to more people. Verses 20 through 27 says, And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Verse 21 says, And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he was, talk, as he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath. By the way, Goliath had been doing this for 40 days. No, I don't always connect numbers, but 40. <laughs> There's like a little bit of significance with 40. The Israelites, 40 years in the desert, 40 days in the desert with Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Goliath, by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. This, just take your, your, your pencil, your pen, just underline these four words. And David heard him. Have you ever wondered why no one else stood up in the previous 40 days? They knew what this guy was going to say. What was it about David that made him respond? What was it that made him respond differently? All of the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him. And they were much afraid. They were, they were paralyzed by their own fear. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered if, if Goliath would have prevailed because these guys were already in a prison. They were so afraid they couldn't even do anything. They just fled. And the men of Israel said, have you not seen this man who has come up? We know where their focus is. Surely he has come up to defy Israel and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. The king, Saul, was so terrified that he's offering uh, like this great benefits package, you know, which included his daughter. That's crazy. Think about that. Like, he's willing to give up his own daughter so that someone else can take care of this. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away this reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I'm going to be explaining that, not in graphic detail here in a second. That he should defy the armies of the living God. And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. You know, we know that the spirit was leading David. We know he had a heart that God wanted to bless. And it says that the spirit rushed upon him. I believe that the Holy Spirit was working in David. And I believe that 
It was David's faith in God, his simple belief that God would prevail, that he could trust God, that he didn't have to cower in fear to anything or to anyone. You know, we're qualified to question fear like that too. Because when we say, God, my life is yours, and Jesus comes into our life, it's Jesus' heart working through us that faces fear with courage. And yeah, there will be moments where we see like people see, but then hopefully through a small group or through opening up God's word, maybe your spouse prays for you, or God just blows your mind in a moment and reminds you that this is not the end. That you don't have to see what it, what. what was so in Israel's face. I mean, the, the text goes to the painful detail of making sure you understand how big Goliath really was. He, he was close to 10 feet tall. He had 150 pounds of armor, and, and it was bronze. It was like the latest and greatest in, in military technology. He had an entourage with him. He had this armor bearer who would go before him, and this guy was big. He meant business, and it's like that's all they could see. That's literally what the text says in verse 24. Have you seen this guy? But David saw something different, and he enters into the conversation, and I don't think it's arrogance that David asks about the benefits. I just think he's emotionally intelligent. Right? Like, you don't, standing in a line when you're trying to talk to someone about Jesus, you don't just like, hey, if you died tonight, I know that that used to be the method, but it's, it's not always the method anymore. You might comment about something that you're mutually there for, right? David is like, hey, what, what's going on for the guy? I mean, he's entering into the conversation, but let me tell you about crucible moments. You will never experience all that God has for you if you are only material motivated. Why do I know this? Because there was a lot being given and offered, and for 40 days, no one was willing to take it. David doesn't care about this stuff. Why do I know that? Because he starts with where they are, but he goes to where they need to be. He starts there because he's emotionally intelligent. He's not going to alienate his brothers right there. He starts there because that's where they are. They're, they're, they're thinking about all the benefits that could happen, like winning the lottery or something, you know? But none of us are willing to actually do anything about it. And David, David enters into the conversation, but he sees things differently. This is, why, this is why I believe, and some people would say, well, David was arrogant. I think he was audacious. He, he, he wasn't arrogant. I just, I'm telling, I have no problem saying David was an adulterer. He was a sinner. There were moments that did not honor God, but I don't think that was this moment. He was boasting, but he was never boasting in himself. Just take your pen or pencil and circle 26, 37, 45 through 47. I mean, this is, this is what he says to the people who are listening. I mean, he, he, he couches the conversation in a different language. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That was David's way of saying, this is not God's man. This is not God's person. He doesn't have a soft heart towards the Lord. He is not willing to follow him with a whole heart. That's what circumcised, uncircumcised mean. That's why the New Testament will talk about circumcised as, as having a pure heart, a heart that's open to God, that desires him to do something specific. It was a physical thing that would eventually signify something spiritual, but actually it was meant to phys physically signify something and spiritually signify something in the Old Testament as well. Who is this guy that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice what he didn't say. Who is this guy that he would define the armies of the shepherd of the hills of Jesse? No. He doesn't say that. When Saul brings him forward and Saul has all of these questions for him and, and he references his past in, uh, in, in verse 37, he says, the Lord delivered me. He, he used my, my skill set, but it was God who delivered me. David understands who he's boasting in. And I love the way he says it to Goliath. We're going to hit that really hard in a couple weeks, 45 through 47. It's, it's really clear. You... you Goliath had an agenda, and it was Goliath. David had an agenda, and it was God. There's a big difference when you try to live this life only selfishly pursuing your own ambitions. You'll never live for something bigger. You could have the world offered to you. It was offered to this entire army, and it wasn't enough to get them off the battle line. But someone came along who had an agenda that wasn't his own agenda. He believed that God had called his people to live for something more. And who is this guy telling us what we should do? I will not put up with that. 
Dads, I want you to say amen to that because that's what God is calling you to do for your family. Moms, I want you to say amen to that because that is what God is calling you to do for your family. Do not look at your circumstances or the size of your problem. Look at the size of the God that you serve. If you can point your people to the eyes uh, to be able to see God, they will be able to experience a long life of faithfulness. But if you just rescue them every time because it, you can do it in your own strength, they'll never see what God wants to do in the hearts of his sons and daughters. What are your qualifications? What do you see? What does Orange County need? What does Southern California need? Are you kidding me? We're facing all sorts of immense problems. All sorts of issues in the United States, in Orange County, in Southern California. This is not the Orange County that you grew up in, the Orange County uh, of, of, the, of the Jesus movement. It's not anymore. One out of every two people that you meet doesn't even have any religion. They're not Muslim, Buddhist, Christian. They're nothing. They say they're nothing. And that doesn't even include all of the nominalism that exists. There is less than 10% of the people in this county, 9 out of every 10 people that you will meet, do not have a vibrant relationship with Jesus. And guess who the only person is who can refocus us on what is true? It's Jesus. There's no way that we can just muster enough faith to have a, enough faith that we can palpably focus on defeating the enemy. It happens when we place our trust in God. The Old Testament is an opportunity for us to be reminded that we need someone greater than David. David died. He screwed up. He messed up. But Jesus didn't stay dead. <laughs> he beat sin on the cross. He rose from the grave. And the same resurrection power, which pours out in the beginning of Acts and fills you to the to the brim, to where you can actually follow him and you can be refilled every single day is available to you. It is at your disposal. And trust me, there are people who need a word from God every single day in your life. But some of you have not focused on God. You have not seen what Jesus can do. And because of that, you're paralyzed in fear and you're not free to follow him. But if you will focus on God and refocus on God and refocus on God because the spirit makes it about him and not you he makes it about you and not the problems if you will cultivate an intimacy with him you will be able to follow him to wherever it is that he's calling you to go one of my favorite passages when I get overwhelmed by anxiety and fear and it still happens and I have to ask the Lord will you fill me with your peace will you fill me will you fill me with your spirit is Philippians 4 6 through 9 just write that in your notes that's one of those verses you need to internalize that passage will help you refocus on what you need to focus on the God of calm not chaos the God of faith not fear the God of peace not panic the God of faithfulness not our failure the God of good not gloom the God of love not loss you see when you refocus on God and when you begin to see with his eyes and you begin to understand your crucible moment in the lens that God desires to give you. Things are repositioned in such a way that will bring God a lot of glory. God can bless a man or a woman who has one single agenda, and that's him. George Scott, the man who I referenced earlier, was not born with one leg. He was born with two. He was born in Scotland in a time and he was raised to be a farmer. That's what his parents did. That's what he expected to do. That's what everyone would have expected George to do, except when he was 19 years old, just maybe a little bit older than some of our youth that are here today, just a little bit. He tripped and fell. He hit his knee on a rock. And for two years, he struggled with a leg that was, that ballooned out because of the, the, the puffiness, the, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The swelling. See, this is a, preaching is a community event. For two years. So now he's 21. The doctors have a look at him and they're thinking, this is in the 1800s. They're thinking, George, we're going to have to amputate. Can you imagine being 21 years old? Like your whole life is ahead of you. You got, you can do your life as a farmer. You could do whatever it is that you think that you're supposed to do. And now all of a sudden the doctor is telling you, you got to amputate your leg. 
So they amputate his leg, and for the next nine months, he's laying helpless in bed because he can't get up. But it's while he's helpless in bed, surrendered to the circumstance that the Spirit of God shows him who he is. And this guy gets a vision of God and who he is. And he he finally starts to think about God's love because of his situation. And God raises him up, and he doesn't become a farmer. He becomes a teacher. He's teaching for a couple years, and his heart has been changed because of what God does during this nine months of laying on that bed. And this crucible moment in George Scott's life was a major defining moment, not just for him, but for the million-plus believers who live in China because this guy said, I don't see those with two legs going. And then Hudson Taylor, who we all know because he was the leader in the face of the thing, was willing to see that God's hand is all on this. Friends, there's nothing that we face, nothing that we face that we can't face with God. And everyone else is talking about how big the problem is, how terrifying Goliath is. And here comes David. No one's expecting it from him, but God sees what's in his heart. And we do this with youth a lot. Well, oh, you're just a young person. We're going to just put you off to the side. But man, maybe we need to take our grandkids out and ask them what God is able to do in this generation. Maybe we need to take our son or our daughter and say, what do you think God can do in this situation so that our faith can have the scales ripped off and we can see the unlimited nature of God when we're willing to believe for greater things. And the thing that God is doing in us will launch us into the future. You don't think that this this moment in time was just for David. God used it as a platform for him. When I read David and Goliath, I always think of the slingshot. (laughs) Because I think of how inadequate a slingshot is in comparison to the other military achievements that uh, were being used on the battlefield. God takes the little things and he does big things. He'll take the little things and he'll do big things. He'll take the unwise and he'll confound the wise. He'll take the foolish and he'll lift it up and make it into something that's beautiful, that's worthy of being called a trophy. And God isn't worried about where we are in the world. He has a plan. He, he, He does. He has a sovereign plan. It's you. He wants to put you into this slingshot and he wants to pull it back and that's hard it's painful and he wants to release this thing right into the heart of evil so that his light can shine so that people can be free so that people do not have to live in darkness and he's going to use you to do it would you stand this morning i'm grateful for a god who never gives up on us he always has a plan if we're willing to question what everyone is terrified for and laugh in the face of these feelings that come up inside of us but we know do not honor god and we refocus on him he will lead us and there will be fruit that follows there will be people that are freed there will be people that find jesus there will be reasons that you've sacrificed the way that you've sacrificed just stay focused on God there was a man in the last service who had just lost his job and we prayed and sometimes it's very hard to stay focused on God when you're gripped by the paralyzing fear of what could be and friend I want you to refocus on God today with every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we just ask that you would help us refocus on you in the midst of our issue, in the midst of our problem, in the midst of our crucible moment. Lord, will you redefine our lives as we refocus on you, on your character, on your plan, on your purpose. Your word says perfect love casts out all fear. So, Jesus, we invite perfect love into our hearts today. And if you've never invited perfect love into your heart, it's as simple as this. God, I open up my life to you, and I invite Jesus to come live inside of me. 
we give you our heart so that you can bless the heart that you give us back. And Father, I also ask that you would, through Christ, pour out your spirit into our lives. Baptize us, God, so that we are not afraid of what normal people are afraid of, but we can follow you without fear, holding us back. Lead us to wherever it is that you're calling us to go. Not just as a church, but I'm praying that over the individual lives of people who are leading your families somewhere today. Use your priests, use your leaders, use your moms, use your dads to lead like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, this is Pete from Newport Mesa Church. We want to thank you for joining us today. Here at Newport Mesa Church, we're all about changed lives. If this message encouraged you, we'd love to hear about your story. So connect with us on our webpage or email us at info at newportmesa.org. If you'd like to support the ministry here, you can give through our website or our mobile app. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you next week.